I do look forward uh, to heaven. I hope you do. He, he's going to fix all this stuff. We have several hundred new people coming here, which is awesome in the last few months. And some of you don't know my situation. I've got a, a nine-year-old son named Luke who has special needs, and Luke's never spoken. And just yesterday, I, was, I get Luke sometimes, and he's a huge kid, but I, I can still do it. That's why I work out, so I can wrestle with Luke. That's the only reason. But I get Luke, and I roll him on the bed from side to side, and every time I roll him, he just laughs. And even though he can't speak, you can't take away someone's joy. And I'm thinking, God's going to fix that. And no matter what you're going through, that God's going to fix that. That's why heaven sucks. I hope, I hope these aren't just songs you're singing. I hope this, this is not just a building that you come to once a week. I hope that Jesus Christ is everything to you. Either he is God or he's just another religious leader. And if he's God, he's going to fix everything. I hope you understand that this morning. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 15. We're going to end this series, Christianoscopy, right where we started it. Luke chapter 15. The story of the two lost sons. You may know it as the prodigal son, but we call it the two lost sons because there's really two lost sons. There's a younger son who was wayward and rebellious, who wanted his father's inheritance now, who asked for his third, who took his third while his father was still alive, which is the same as looking at his father saying, you're dead to me, I want nothing to do with you, went and did what he wanted to do, where he wanted to do it, to live the life he wanted to live. There is a wayward son's mentality with many of us, whether it be past or even present and probably even in the future. But then there's an elder son, which many of us relate to more. We call him the elder son. He was a son that was self-righteous. Many Christians, I believe, are elder sons. I think our churches are packed with elder sons. Elder sons who, even though his younger brother comes home and there's a party and there's great rejoicing, the dad, the younger son, the whole town are inside the banquet hall. Everyone's at the feast, the party, except one person. Who is it? The elder son. The elder son's on the back porch, mad, steaming, because dad's excited about that guy. He wouldn't even call him his brother or by name. That son of yours is back. And he's going over his list of how he's kept all the rules and see, the elder son mentality is just that. God, I've got a list. I do all the right things. I keep all the rules. And the reason elder sons keep the rules, I don't want you to miss this, the reason we keep the rules is because there's some sense of control that now God owes us. If I do all the right things, then God is indebted to me to bless me. See, the problem with that mentality is you can do all the right things, i.e. Job, and everything goes wrong, then what? Well, then God's not a good God. And we talk about it all the time here that maybe God does his best work and shows his most love in the hardest points of your life. But there's this elder son mentality. What I love about the father in this story, which is a picture of God our father, is he's not sitting there just stamping his foot waiting for the son to come home. He is going out every day looking for his son, and when he sees him, what does he do? He hikes his robe up, and he runs to him, and he embraces him, and he kisses him. And the son, which we think of repentance as writing down all the wrong things we've done and going over it one by one with God and saying how really, really, really sorry we are. That's just part of repentance. But the son has this repentance plan set up where he's going to go through all the wrongs. And I love how the father just interrupts him and says, you know what? I don't have time to listen to your repentance. I love you. we got a party to put on. And then there's the elder son. I want you to see the context of Luke 15. Look at verse 1 and 2. Here's, here's the reason Jesus teaches this parable. Now all the tax gatherers and the sinners were coming near him to listen. And both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. you got two sets of people. You've got a ton of younger brothers listening to these parables. Sinners. And then you've got a group of elder brothers listening Pharisees. 
And most of the church today fits in that second category. And yet we forget that all of us were younger brothers at one point. Now, you may have had a list of rights that you kept. You're a good younger brother, but it doesn't matter. You're rebellious in the same way. And what's amazing about this story is that's the context that the father goes to both sons, embraces both sons, and pleads for both sons to come into the reception. He goes to the angry, moral, religious person on the back porch, even him, and says, I want you to come into my intimacy. These are the same folks who are going to hand him over, the Pharisees, to the Roman government to literally nail him to a tree. And yet he loves the wayward free spirits, and he loves the rule-keeping moralist who thinks by their own self-righteousness that they're better than most, so therefore they get into heaven, whereas most don't, because they don't do all the good things I do. See, if you're going to repent, You've got to repent of the sin, the root sin that's under all the list, and that is the sin of pride. You see, Pharisees repent of their sins because the list is short, but what they need to repent of is for all the right things they did with the wrong motivation to do it. You see, we think of doing right and wrong things. Wrong things are sin and bad. We need to repent. But what about the good things you do and the impetus to do them is so God will owe you something in return? Matter of fact, when the Bible talks about sin, it talks more about doing the right things for the wrong reason than doing the wrong things. And yet I believe that most of our views of God and how he inter interacts with us is built on the elder brother mentality. So how does a person who is lost yet has no major wrongdoing get saved? You've got to deal with the pride. As one writer put it, and I'm going to use some frank language here, but I think it has, serves a point. The main barrier between Pharisees and God is not their sins, but their damnable good works. I think when you have an elder brother mentality of list keeping, that it's real easy to see other people as bad, sinful people that don't deserve to have Christ the way you have them. And the truth is, you don't even have them. Because he will not be in debt to you based on your good works. Elder brothers only repent of their sins. Christians repent of the reason we did anything right in the first place with the wrong motive. The real issue, guys, is we seek to be the Savior ourselves. That's the real issue. I want to control things. And if I can control God by doing the right things, then I'll keep the list. If I can control God by doing the wrong things and act like he doesn't exist or ignore him as, as a reality, then I'll do that. But either way, I want to be in charge. The problem is the older you get, the more you realize you're really not in charge of much at all. <laughs> but really, this story is the third of three parables, so let me give you the full context. If you go to the first parable in Luke 15, it's a parable known as the lost sheep. Look with me at verse 3. Keep it in, in, in thought He's talking to sinners, and he's talking to religious Pharisees. He says, and he told them this parable, saying, What man among you, if he has a hundred sheep, and has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open pasture, and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I tell you that in the same way there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents, than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Then he goes to parable number two, known as the lost coin. Or what woman, if she has ten silver coins and loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin which I had lost. In the same way I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And then he goes to the third parable, the parable of the two lost sons. Let me point a, f a few things out. <clears throat> In each parable, something's lost. A sheep, a coin, sons. In each parable, the one who loses something gets it back. In each parable, there's a festive party, a rejoicing that happens as a response to the fact that something was lost but is now found. But there is one difference between the first two parables and the third parable. I don't know if it has hit you yet. But in the first two parables, someone goes out diligently to search and recover what was lost. 
in the third parable, you get to the third parable, the audience, if you're a good listening audience, is sitting there thinking, who's going to go out to find this wayward son? Because the shepherd goes out, the woman looks, who's going to go out and find this younger brother? Will it be the father? Will it be the elder son? Because there is an elder son brother lost and someone's got to go look for him. And then the question just hangs in the air. And then the reality hits that no one's going out to look for this younger brother. Jesus, I believe, is inviting this crowd into the question, who is the ideal elder brother that's going to look for you? Now, if you know your Bible well, you would automatically think of a story when we go through this parable. If you go all the way back to Genesis 4, same story, different circumstances. There's an elder brother named Cain. There's a younger brother named Abel. They both bring their sacrifice to the Lord. They both have their list. One list from Abel is motivated by the fact that I want to bring honor and glory to God. One sacrifice, the elder brother, is motivated by I'm going to give as much as I can or as much as I think I can, but I'm doing it to earn God's love so he will bless me. And then God receives both sacrifices, but then he turns and rejects Cain's. And it's interesting because Cain then does exactly what this elder son does in Luke 15. He murders his brother. The elder son didn't murder his brother in Luke 15, but the same thing. He's good as dead to me. I don't even acknowledge him as being my brother anymore. And then it's very interesting. When God starts to interact with Cain on the murder of his brother, Cain's response is, am I my brother's keeper? And the implication that God gives in Genesis 4 is, yes, you are. And I believe Genesis 4 and Luke 15 are connected theologically. When Jesus gets to Luke 15, I think the question hangs is, who should go after this younger brother? And the answer is, the elder brother. But he doesn't do it because he is a Pharisee. And Pharisees don't go after rebellious younger brothers. Pharisees write rebellious young brothers off. And he's on the back porch, and he's stewing, and he's got his list. You see, forgiveness always comes at a cost to the one that extends it, not the one that receives it. The elder brother, if he goes and looks for this younger brother, he loses another portion of his inheritance if he comes back home with him. He's got to give up more of his stuff, and he's not willing to do it. The bad thing about this younger brother is his elder brother is not a true elder brother. He's a Pharisee. But thanks be to God, we have a true elder brother. His name is Jesus. Jesus not only is willing to leave a village or a town, he left a country called heaven to come to the farthest place in the universe called earth to look for us the wayward brother. Not only did he give a robe up, he died on the cross so that you and I could be clothed with the robe of righteousness, the Bible says. Not only is he willing to forgive, but he's willing to become the slain lamb so that you and I can eat from the bread of life. Jesus went through great misery so you and I could have a party. Matter of fact, the Bible ends with the thoughts of the power of a party. I'm going to show you a couple of verses. Revelation chapter 19, verse 9. And the angel said to me, write this, talking to John. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. And he added, these are true words that come from God. Blessed are those who get an invitation to the party when all this stuff is going to get fixed. Let me show you another verse. Revelation 22, verse 17. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let anyone who hears this come. Let anyone who's thirsty come. Let anyone who desires to drink freely from the water of life. The implication is what? Come. Who gets an invitation to come to the party? Everyone and anyone. Who's going to come to the party? Those who understand that Jesus is the ideal elder brother. Those that will come home. Now, what I love about this story is, and I love about a party, my, my daughter, who's 10, gets party invitations all the time. Parties are big things for kids. And you know, the first question is, if, if Courtney says, we got a party invitation today, you know her first question is, whose party? Because i got to decide if I want to go or not. And then what's the first question she has when she goes back to school the next day? Who's going? Well, the Bible answers all these questions. Who's throwing the party? God. Who's going to be there? All of his children. Who's coming? Me. <laughs> Hopefully you. Now I want to go to another story that I think connects to this, and we're going to end the series with this story. Go back to John, or forward to John, the next book over. 
As I was thinking about the parable of the two lost sons, my thought was, what's the first miracle that Jesus did? Because, you know, if you're going to do the first one, it's going to kind of start with a bang. Because everyone's going to remember the first miracle. What was the first miracle Jesus did? If you go to John 2, we see the first miracle. And I think they're connected. John chapter 2. He's going to turn water into wine. Now, I've heard people use this story to justify a mass consumption of alcohol. I think you're stretching. You need to understand what wine and alcohol was in the, Old Testament, in the New Testament time. It was three parts water, one part wine. A lot of times it was 20 to 1, and Pharisees sometimes would have it 100 to 1. It's nothing like the wine you and I have today. Or you, I don't drink it. It's nothing like the wine you have today. <laughs> I think it tastes nasty. Nothing like that. Okay? And so you can't use this passage as that. If anything, Jesus is... is, is passing out something a little stronger than what we would see today as grapefruit juice. All right? Now, watch what he does. Verse 1. On the third day, let me tell you what that means. Three days ago, he had just called Nathaniel to be a disciple. Okay? Now, he's got five disciples at this point, counting himself as six. Three-day journey to get to Cana to a party that he'd been invited to, a wedding feast. Most wedding feasts would last from anywhere from two to seven days. Can you imagine Dad's paying for reception for seven days. And it depended on how much money the family had. And what would happen is if you were to run out of food or drink at this party, it was such a disgrace to your family that you could be fined financially for running out of stuff. True story. People would never have respect for your family again. This is a big deal what's going to happen in this story. So Jesus and his five men travel 90 miles, about 30 miles a day, three-day journey, and they get to the party. Uh, It's about day six of probably what's going to be a seven-day party based on what happens in this story. It's also that would make it because a virgin got married on Wednesdays, a widow got married on Thursdays. We don't know if this is a virgin or a widow getting married, but either way, he's arriving at the party on the Sabbath. And so it's his day of rest. Jesus should get a day off right here. And he walks in this party. And see what happens. And the mother of Jesus was there, verse 1 tells us. And Jesus also was invited and his disciples to the wedding. And when the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman. Now I want you to know that's not a harsh term. That is, literally it says, little woman or dear one. Okay. It's it's a term of endearment. But Jesus is making a point, which I'm going to explain what I think it is. Woman, what do I have to do with you? My hour has not yet come. If you come from a faith, a religious background, a church background, that takes Jesus and puts Mary right there with him, it's not biblical. John wants you to understand real quickly in this gospel that Jesus is in charge of his life and the details of it, not Mother Mary. That the Father's will is revealed to him daily by the hour And John takes a theme all the way through his gospel about the hour. And he's going to say it here. The hour has not yet come. The hour has not yet come. And John is letting you know that Jesus' schedule is divine. And it's not determined by his mother. It's not determined by his father. It's not determined by anyone else. It's determined by the father who he's obeying 100%. And so he looks at his mother. And this is actually number two. Earlier, when he's 12 years old, he goes to a synagogue and starts teaching. And his parents are all upset. And they're like, why are you doing this to us? It's like, hey, I had to be about my father's business. And he's letting them know your supervision of me ends here. I'm here to do what the father has called me to do. Look what happens. His mother, this is the best thing Mary said her whole life. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says, you do it. <laughs> whatever he says, you do it. Now, there were six stone water pots set there for the Jewish custom of purification, containing 20 or 30 gallons each. Now, what were the custom pots set aside? Because if you're coming into a feast that there's a lot of drinking and you're about day six of a seven-day party, what do you have lying around everywhere? A bunch of empties, right? A bunch of cups, a bunch of containers, a bunch of jars. Jesus could have used any of those to fill them up with new wine, but he chose... These religious purification jars, let me tell you what the purpose of these jars were. 
they, it says they held 20 to 30 gallons. So he's about to make anywhere from 120 to 180 gallons of wine. Kind of a cool first miracle niche he's got going here. And these pots were used by Pharisees. Now, they would use these pots to ceremonially cleanse their hands before they went to the temple to do the sacrifices of the priesthood. But what the Pharisees had done in their own self-righteousness, they had taken a step further. They would take these pots into homes and they would cleanse their hands in the homes as a sign to show that you, that I will not be stained by you sinners or anything of the world. It was used as a religious icon, if you will, to separate the sinners from the pious people. And so Jesus is sitting there and he says, I'm going to take the religious icon over there and I'm going to do something totally different. Jesus' first miracle is to destroy a religious icon. Because Jesus' point's going to be, and he's going to say, this is a sign. Jesus' mission was this. Any religion, any system, any institution, any tradition, any ritual, any rules that you set up that make you think that you earn God's approval by keeping them, I'm going to destroy all of that because all of that is fulfilled in me. Follow me. So, he takes the water pots, tells them to empty them. Look what he says, verse 7. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. And they took it to him. And when the head waiter tasted the water which had become wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, every man serves the good wine first, and when men have drunk freely, then that which is poor, you have kept the good wine until now. You get your party guests drunk, then you give them the bad stuff. They won't know the difference. You know, I think there's another implication here. I believe the world gives you the best first, gets you hooked, gets you deceived in a lie, and it feeds you garbage from there on out. But you're already hooked into the lie. Look at the next verse. This beginning of his signs. This is the word miracle. He uses a specific word in the Greek called signs. What's the purpose of a sign? To show you which way to go. Jesus is saying this is the first. John's going to give you seven miracles. The first of seven signs to show you why Jesus came. And the first sign is I'm going to take a religious icon, destroy it, because something totally new is about to happen. Now, let's play a little word game. If I say Jesus and you write down ten things that pop in your mind, I guarantee you irreligious is not one of them. And yet Jesus' first miracle is, I've got to reprogram you guys to think about what it looks like to be in a relationship with God the Father. He also, it's interesting, he turns water into wine. There was an Old Testament character who turned water into blood, Moses. And blood in your Old Testament is a symbol of judgment of God. And then here comes Jesus all along. He turns water into wine in your Old Testament. Wine is a symbol of joy and blessing. And so Jesus comes and he says, before your rules will lead to judgment because no one can keep them. But I'm starting something new here today. And in the joy of me as the son of God, as you follow me, you then will have God's love in your life. It's amazing. Jesus takes holy water and turns into wedding wine. He takes uh, legalism and turns into life. He takes religion and turns into relationship. He takes a fast and turns it into a feast. I love following the God who says, man, let's have good parties. Karl Marx and others have charged, have charged that religion is the opiate of the masses. That is, it's a sedative that makes religious people indifferent to injustices around them, passive. I don't believe for Christianity that it's an opiate for people. I believe it's the smelling salts for the earth. Now, growing up playing sports, one time playing basketball, I got knocked an elbow in my head. I scored, but that's beside the point. I got knocked an elbow in my head, and I was out cold. And I don't remember this because I was out cold, but they said the gym was just going crazy. And there I lay on the floor. And then the next thing I knew, the trainer's over me, and he's got smelling salts under my nose. And I'm, what's the purpose of smelling salts? Bring you back to your senses. It awakes you from the dead. What's the purpose of our purpose of being here as good elder brothers? We go after the wayward sons and bring them back to their senses because we're the smelling salts of the earth. The purpose of a Christian is to be the ideal elder brother. And yet, as we look to this series, most younger brothers view Christians as showing contempt toward them. 
Martin Luther said that religion is the default mode of the human heart. I think he's right. You know, your computer has a default mode. If you don't touch it in a certain amount of time, it goes into a certain kind of default mode. If you don't reteach the gospel to yourself every day, you're going to naturally go back into a flesh mode that's going to do the things you do to earn God's favor as opposed to do the things you do because you've been given God's favor. I think that it's pertinent you set your hearts in gospel mode every day. Also, Jesus, uh, or God prophesied in the Old Testament that he would raise up a prophet like Moses. Guess what John 2 does? Jesus saying, I'll turn water into wine because I'm the one that God prophesied about in the Old Testament as being the prophet after Moses. And I'll take the law that Moses even taught that he got from the Father and I'll fulfill it. There's something new about to happen. The Jesus described in the Bible is not a portrayer, is not portrayed as a founder of a world religion. Let me say that again. The Jesus found in the Bible is never portrayed as the start of a world religion. He is portrayed as the challenger of all religions. The primary mission of Jesus is to tear down religions as the foundation of how people justify connecting to God through their own good works. Let me give you a definition. This is just a simple definition. I put together what I believe religion is, okay? Because I don't think Christianity is religion. Let me give you this definition. Religion, any reliance on systems, institutions, rules, rituals, or traditions to be our connection and our way to God in order to earn his approval. Notice I didn't say there's anything wrong with systems, institutions, rules, or traditions. Nothing wrong with stained glass windows, if that's what you like. Nothing wrong with it. It's sinful, though, when those things become your way to earn God's approval by keeping a checklist. I love stained glass windows, actually. But a stained glass window can't save me. Church has never saved anybody. I love Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace has never saved anyone. Jesus saves people. And where we get this backwards, we become the elder brother thinking, Dad, I got my list right here. I've never done anything wrong. You know, the, the father in that story never says anything against the son there. He never says, you know what, when you were three, you kind of mouthed off. Never said anything because this guy had a short list. But he didn't have intimacy with the father. I think it's possible to be in church and be very religious and have no relationship with the father. Matter of fact, I read great commentaries by great theologians and it's empty words because they don't know God. They know about him, but they don't know him. My question is, do you know him? I hope that this is not just a place we come to once a week. Karl Barth had a great quote. He said, the revelation of God is the abolition of religion. I believe he's exactly right. I believe John 2 changed everything. I believe the revelation of him turning water into wine through a religious icon was the abolition of religion. I believe what Dietrich Bonhoeffer said is true. A great preacher during the, the Nazi years. He said, we need a religionless Christianity to make an impact. Do I hug my wife to earn her love or do I hug my, life, my wife in response to a love that we already share? That's the difference between religion and true faith. The goodness we live out in our lives is an act of gratitude not to earn God's favor. We don't do good things for the warden so that we get out early parole. We do the things we do because we've been released for no reason. Sometimes people ask me if all religions lead to God. and I, It's usually a trap to see if I'm going to be exclusive about Christianity. And my answer is the same. I don't believe that any religion leads to God. I believe Jesus leads to God. Religion does not lead to God any more than cups quench your thirst. Religion is like a cup, someone who's thirsty, really needing a drink, and they lick the outside of the cup. They love the cup. A cup can't quench your thirst. It's the water inside, and the Bible says that Jesus Christ himself is the fountain of living water. Let me sum up our Christianoscopy series with, here's my goal for why I did this series. This is, I want to share with you a verse from Psalm, this is Psalm 85, verse 10. This is what I want the ridge to be. Not just me, but all of our leadership. Loving kindness and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. When people think about their ridge, I want them to say, 
Those folks are great theologians with great doctrine, and they ferociously love people who don't know Jesus. That once and for all, Jesus Christ, the ideal elder brother, shows that we can have great theology and great doctrine and be great students of the scriptures and be ferocious, passionate lover of people. That they don't have to separate somewhere lost in the chaos of religion. We need to understand that in most cases in our culture, that people want to belong before they believe. But yet the church has always gotten that backwards. You've got to belong. I mean, you've got to believe, and then you can belong. People aren't going to walk in here and say, you're right, Jesus is the only way. I agree. That was a great song. You know how they're going to get to the point of understanding Jesus is the only answer, and the world has nothing else to offer? It's by seeing your life being different in the way you love and care for them. You know why people come back to church? Not because the pastor is a good-looking guy. They come back to church because someone out there or out there loved on them. We need to view church not as a community of people. or We need to see it as a community of people, not as a Sunday service. Church isn't somewhere you go. Church is something you do. Church is who you are. Church is every day of the week. The gospel is not just about getting you to heaven in the future. The gospel is about living the Jesus-filled, servant, compassionate life now. Jesus looked at those who rejected him and he wept. Are we like Jesus? Do we ever weep as Jesus did for those who rejected him or maybe reject you? Do we have compassion for those outside the church who are clueless about the abundant life found in Jesus? And honestly, the reason I think a lot of them are clueless about the abundance found in Jesus is because they look at Christians and they don't see abundance. We're just like everybody else. Never forget where some of you came from. Let me change that. I'll get an email. Let us never forget where some of us came from. 1 Corinthians 6, Paul lists out this whole list of sins. You're going, yeah, Paul, get them. And he says, and such were some of you. Most of us admit that Jesus changed our lives, but let us not forget that Jesus can also change anyone else's life. Am I numb or neutral to people outside the church? Do I intercede daily for people outside the church? Who am I praying for now that is not a Christian? When's the last time I had coffee, went to a movie, or just hung out with someone who is not a believer? There's something terribly wrong when the majority of people outside the church look inside the church and they like Jesus more than they like his followers. Something's not right. I have a Woody Allen quote there, a great theologian on your focus at the bottom. Woody Allen said, if Jesus came back and saw what was being done in his name, he would not be able to stop throwing up. I think Woody's right. Martin Luther said, and he may have butchered Luther's quote there, but Martin Luther said, if I were the world and it treated me the way it treated him, I would kick the vile, wretched thing to pieces. That's not what Jesus did. The Father goes out and says, won't you come into the party? I want you here. I want to be intimate with you. Ephesians 5 tells us that we're the bride of Christ. Can you imagine going to a wedding and going up to the groom saying, I love the groom, but that bride, woo! <laughs> It'd be an insult to the groom. And that's exactly what people say about Jesus, the groom, and the church, the bride. I love the groom. Jesus, mm, spiritual. Man, those Christians. Younger brothers are too selfish to care about anyone else. Elder brothers are too self-righteous to care about anyone else. May we be the ideal elder brothers in the city of Austin. You follow me? That's why we did this series. What's the application of this series? The application of this series is next Sunday. Next Sunday, May 2nd, we're going to go do church in the city of Austin. We've got some service projects lined out. And I know some of you have already thought, great, I get next Sunday off. I think what we're going to do next Sunday may be more biblical than anything else we ever do as a church. So I want you to be a part of it. Matt, our outreach pastor is going to come tell you some details about it.